dreadfully nervous. I had been an am, but why would you say that I am am? This disease, it's sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. How then am I man? Hearken and observe how calmly, how healthily I can tell you the whole story. It's impossible to say how this idea first entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none, passion there was none. I loved the old man, he never wronged me, he never given me insult. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Every time it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I decided to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of this eye forever. As a part of human nature, people are haunted by their guilt from the time we are children until the very day we die, whether the action is small, like the telling of a white lie, or perhaps something a bit larger, people can be consumed by their past, past actions. Through this classic tale by Edgar Allan Poe, we can see how one man's guilt led to his inevitable madness. A Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Mad men know nothing. Oh, but you should have seen me. I was never kinder to the old man the whole week before I killed him. And every night, just at midnight, I turned the lock of his door and went oh, so gently. And then when I had made an opening sufficient enough for my head, I put in a lantern all closed, closed so that no light shone through, and then I thrust in my head. And then when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, Oh, so cautiously I ended it, so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture's eye. This I did for seven long nights, but alas, I found the eye always closed. So it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning I walked boldly into the chamber, addressing the old man by name and inquiring how he had spent the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at midnight, I looked upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in the opening of the door. Never before that night had I felt the true extent of my power, of my sagacity. I fairly chuckled at the thought, and perhaps he heard me, for he stirred suddenly in the bed as if startled. Now you may think I drew back the bed. The room was black as pitch in the thick darkness, so I knew he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing on it steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern, my thumb slipped on the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not see him lie down. He was still sitting on the bed, listening, I had done night after night. When I had waited a long time, very, very patiently, I resolved to opening a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it until at length a single thin ray, like the thread of a spider, shot through the crevice and fell full upon the vulture's eye. It was open. Wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil that chilled the very marrow of my bones. But I saw nothing else but the old man's face or person, for I had shown the ray, as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. Now I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound. It was the sound a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew the sound well. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury the way the beating of a drum stimulates a soldier into courage. And yet I refrained, kept quite still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the old man's heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. His terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder. Do you mark me well when I say I was nervous? So I am. It grew louder, louder, louder. I thought his 
heart may burst, and now a new anxiety seized me. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I leaped into the room. I dragged the old man onto the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. For many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. You would think so no longer when I described to you the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. I <laughs> drew three planks from the floorboards and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the planks so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have ever detected anything was wrong. When I had made an end to my labors, it was nearly four o'clock, still black as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I to fear? In entered three men who introduced themselves as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor, information had been lodged at the police office, and they had been deputed to search the premise. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I made the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I led them all throughout the house. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasure secure, undisturbed. With the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired the men here to rest from their fatigues, while I, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own chair upon the spot beneath which reposed the corpse. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. We, we sat, and while I answered cheerily, they spoke a familiar thing. My dear Vaughan, I wish they were gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. The ringing became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but the noise increased and gained deafness until at length I realized was not coming from within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale, but what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much the sound a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I, I rose and argued about trifles and I key with violent gesticulations. Why would they not be gone? I, I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what can I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I took the chair with which I had been sitting and grated it upon the floorboards, but the noise arose over all and steadily increased. And yet the men sat pleasantly and, and smiled. It's impossible they heard not. Almighty oh, God. No, no. They heard. They suspected. They knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. Oh, but anything was better than this agony. I could bear their hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, louder, 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 louder. Villains! I should assemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. 